I knew that would get a mixed response there. Um, got got to say, I had nothing to do with that video, but I may endorse what that last slide said, and it's not a typo, not, not the greatest of all time. So, all right, we're going to dive into this subject this morning. We wanted to do that to get your mind triggered thinking a little bit to to consider identity, right? How we recognize people and how others recognize us. If you were to describe yourself to someone, how would you describe who you are? Maybe you could give them your name, where you live, or information about your school, your job, or maybe you're retired, your, your phase of life, where you're at. But when it really got down to describing who you are, how would you describe yourself? Think about that for a moment. How would you describe yourself? Today we're going to begin a new series about identity. And i got to tell you, we're excited to dive into the series. And I really believe it's critical for us. Because we often find our identity in a variety of ways. Relationships. We find our identity maybe in, in family. Maybe it's, it's in a job. Maybe it's in a hobby that we really enjoy. Maybe you would describe yourself and you fill in the blank. I am a, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you find your identity in income, in possessions, in things you enjoy. But if we don't understand what the Bible says about who we are, listen, we're going to struggle with our identity. We're going to struggle with that. If we don't embrace what God's word has to say. I heard a story this week that I think is going to help us get started. All right, Listen to this story. While walking through the forest one day, a man found a young eagle who had fallen out of his nest. He took it home, put it in his barnyard, where it soon learned to eat and behave like the chickens. One day, a neighbor passed by the farm and asked, why it was that the king of all birds should be confined to live in the barnyard with the chickens. The farmer replied that since he had given it chicken feed and trained it, it really had become like a chicken. It never learned to fly, and since it behaved as the chickens, it was no longer an eagle. Still, it has the heart of an eagle, replied the neighbor, and surely it can be taught to fly. He lifted the eagle towards the sky and said, You belong in the sky and not to the earth. Stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle, the eagle however, was confused, didn't know who he was, and seeing the chickens eating their food, he jumped down to be with them again. The neighbor took the bird to the roof of the house and urged him again, saying, You're an eagle. Stretch forth your wings and fly. But the eagle was afraid of his unknown self and whirled and jumped down once more to the chicken food. Finally, the neighbor took the eagle out of the barnyard and took him to a high mountain. There he held the king of the birds high above him and stretched him again, saying, You're an eagle. You belong in the sky. Stretch forth your wings and fly. And the eagle looked all around. He looked way down the valley to the barnyard and up into the sky. And then the man lifted him straight towards the sun, and it happened that the eagle began to tremble. And slowly he stretched forth his wings, and with a triumphant cry, sort away. It may be that the eagle still remembers the chickens with nostalgia. It may even be that he occasionally revisits the barnyard, but he has never returned to lead the life of a chicken and has instead become an eagle. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think there's a lot of truth in that. Because once we find our identity in Christ, our lives are transformed. And we don't have any desire to go back to the old. And we desire to found our new life in Christ. You know, I think some of us can probably identify with the eagle. At the beginning there. Struggling with identity. Some of us struggle with identity because of how we were raised. Because of things that we've gone through. Because of things that have been said to us or about us. We struggle with identity because of what we experience, because of how others treat us. And some struggle with identity because of what we just think of ourselves or 
what we think others think of us. But as we start this series on identity, I truly believe this. I believe that you can't know who you are unless you know who God is. You can't know who you are unless you know who God is. We're going to dive into this sentence right here. And we're going to take this sentence and we're going to kind of launch this series from here. Because identity is about finding purpose and meaning and knowing why we exist. And as much as we might want to dismiss this in some way, shape, or form, this sentence, the reality is you will struggle in life with finding your true identity until you know who God is. And so our goal for you throughout this series is that you will come to find to accept and embrace identity in Jesus Christ. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's commit this series to Him. God, we come this morning recognizing with our finite minds what we have in Christ. And God, we ask and pray that You would just help us to be able to comprehend even just a glimmer of understanding of what it means to find identity through your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray for those who are here today that are struggling with identity. Maybe they've come to this series hoping to find the answers they're looking for, and I pray that they would seek to find answers in you. I pray for those who are not followers of Jesus, that they would recognize how much they need to find identity and how much they need to place their identity in your son. So as we come, Lord, we commit all of this to you. We recognize, God, we need your blessing upon us. We need you to work in our hearts and lives, and so we're asking that you would do that. We're asking that you would do it in a great and mighty way, not for our sake, but for your name's sake, for your glory, and for your honor. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, struggling with identity, it's nothing new. Moses struggled with identity in the Bible in the Old Testament. When God instructed Moses to go and to speak with Pharaoh, Moses was filled with self-doubt. His response was, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And by wording the question in that order, it placed Moses at the center of the equation. But God responded by gently correcting Moses and placing himself in the center by saying, I will be with you. God answered Moses' self-focused question of who I am with the only answer that mattered. I am. Gideon struggled with identity. Gideon was the weakest man in his clan, in his whole tribe, right? How would you like to be known, guys, as the weakest guy in New York State? Right? Nobody wants to sign up for that. That's Gideon. He's the weakest of his clan, and not only that, he's living and hiding. Yet when God called him to lead his nation, he said this to Gideon, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. How Gideon saw himself and how God saw him was entirely different. The Lord would go on to say to him, I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. On his own, Gideon was weak. Gideon was scared. But with God, he was a mighty man of valor that led 350 men to defeat 32,000 Midianites. Thomas, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, was known as the doubter. He saw witness, and he witnessed miracle after miracle after miracle. But after he saw Jesus risen from the dead, once he was able to place his hands in Jesus' hands and his hand in Jesus' side, he no longer was a doubter and was one of the 12 apostles that started the church in the book of Acts. I can tell you personally that there are days when I feel unequipped to lead this church. And I got to tell you, even as of last night, I'm reading these notes, 
And I'm recognizing that I'm nothing more than a Gideon and a Moses. Second guessing who God is through me. And what I had to come to embrace was the idea that in my weakness, God's strength is made perfect. And i got to tell you, boy, that is a phenomenal truth to embrace and to claim. See, you cannot know who you are unless you know who God is. And like the eagle in the chicken coop, you become like what you behold. That's what we're going to talk about today. As we get started on this series, I want to talk for just a few moments about the subject of idolatry. Because when we choose to behold or to make anything but God the focus of our lives, it quickly turns to idolatry. Even good things, right? Even good things. You're like, man, I just need a little peace. Just need a little peace and quiet in my life, God. Listen, if you make the focus If you make peace and quiet the focus of your life, it becomes an idol. If you say, I just need a little comfort in this life or companionship or friendship or relationship, those things can quickly become an idol. They're not necessarily bad things, but when we make them the focus of our life, the desire of our life, they become an idol. Listen to what Psalm 115 says. It says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. The work, something they've developed, something they've created on their own. The idols, verse 5, they have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see, they have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them, catch this, become like them. So do all who trust in them. That's why we titled this, You Become Like What You Behold. If we have idols in their life, those who make idols become like them. Becomes what we're about. When we trust in our game plan, when we trust in our our intentions, our thoughts, those items can become our focus so much so that they become what we behold. They become what we idolize. And the summary of the Bible's explanation of idolatry is that idols shape the way we think, the way we act, and eventually shape the core of our identity. You know, if you read through the Old Testament, I've I've been reading through the Bible, and I'm in in 2 Kings, I'm reading through the Bible in a year, I've just gotten through 1 Kings into 2 Kings, and you read over and over and over and over the amount of kings that don't follow God's ways. And what do they do? They turn to false gods, and they turn to idols. And when there's actually a king, there's none in the nation of Israel, but there's some in Judah in the southern kingdom that actually come in and they do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And many times when a leader did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, one of the first things they did was to go in and to tear down all the idols, to demolish them, to get rid of all of the things that people had worshipped. I just read just this week, and I think it's Hezekiah that tears down and destroys the, the pole with the serpent on it that Moses had used back in the book of Numbers. It had been used for decades, for generations, for years and years and years and years to worship God through an idol, through an image. And God says enough of that. And when a leader actually chose to do what was right in God's eyes, somebody who was focused on him, the first thing they did was to remove idols. So as we talk about the core of our identity it starts with, with putting God where he rightfully needs to be and removing the things in our lives that distract us from God. So as we talk about identity, we need to understand who God is in order to understand who we are. As we start, as we talk about this, I think that right from the get-go, we need to understand who, Ju- who God is from the very first words of the Bible. He's the maker and creator. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Listen, if you don't grab a hold of the fact that God is the maker and creator of all things, you will struggle with identity. John chapter 1 verse 3 says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1.16 says, for by him all, all things were created in heaven and on earth. And I love how 
Paul's like, like uh, let's throw in some categories because people try to think like, well, he forget about this. Visible and invisible. Like, like, he's just trying to add everything in there, right? Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Listen, he's like, forget it. All things. Here's the crux. All things were created through him. And then notice this last phrase, and for him. I love this verse because not only does it describe uh, uh, how we are created, who created us, God created all things, but it also explains why we were created. We were created for him. Notice that last phrase. You were created for him. You were created to worship God. You were made to worship your creator. See, worship is the experience of becoming like what we behold. The more we worship God, the more our focus is on Him, the more we are like God, the more we are like Christ. We were made to worship God. We were made to reflect God. And the way in which we have been made and the way we have been created truly has to do with a fundamental concept of identity. Take a look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. I think this is critical. You need to grab a hold of this this morning. The way in which you were created. Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man, mankind in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. Listen, listen, you were created in the image of God. Grab a hold of that. It's fundamental to understanding identity that mankind is made in the image of God. Made in his likeness. And you might think, yeah, but you don't know me. Because I think God clearly made a couple of mistakes here, right? And you might be able to think of maybe something that, that you do or the way you act or, or a certain trait that you have or you don't like a certain mole or something. I don't know what it is. Listen, God didn't make a mistake with you. You were made in his image. Genesis 1.31 says this, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold... It was very good. This wasn't okay. It wasn't decent. It wasn't good. It was very good. And once we understand that we are made in God's image and why we're made, it's critical to study the one who made us, right? If we're made in the image of God, if we're made in the image of God, then in order to understand us, we need to understand God. We need to understand who he is. We need to understand in whose likeness mankind was created. Recently, Caleb and I, we've been uh, working on a vehicle to get it fixed and, and on the road for him, and we've had to buy some parts. And when you go into a parts store and, and you begin to describe what's going on, the first question that they are going to ask you is, what is the make and model? They don't want to know the color they don't want to know all these other things. They want to know the make and the model. They want to know who made the car in order to identify the car. And if we're going to find our identity, we need to know who made us. We need to know who God is. We need to know his attributes and his character in order to understand who we are to model. I love what Psalm 139, 13 and 14 says this. It says, you were, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are. And I know some of you are like, yeah, but sin and it changes. No, 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 listen. You are made in the image of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. We need to grab a hold of that truth. Because once we grab a hold of that truth, we want to dive into understanding who God is. And once we better understand who God is, then we understand better who we are to be. Well, you know... If you want to do some research on ancestry, you can find some pretty incredible things. I was talking with one of our missionaries, Dan Woodard, about ancestry. He's done all kinds of research about his ancestry. 
so far, he's gone back so far that he's found out he's a distant relative of Abraham Lincoln. I thought that was pretty cool. You can find out some amazing things, and it's pretty awesome to do some of that research. But listen, the best ancestry research you could ever do is to study God's word and to know the one who formed you in your mother's womb, to know the one who formed your inward parts, the one who formed your DNA. Study who God is. You will become like what you behold. And when you behold the one who is the maker and creator of all things, you begin to find true identity in Christ. Well, talking about identity, if you were to identify yourself to someone, if you were to meet someone and you are to shake their hand and, and uh, hi, my name is Ben, uh, good to meet you. Now, who are you? Dave Jones. That's Dave Jones. That's the first thing that we do to describe ourselves, right? We say our name. Someone asks you, who are you? The first response that you have is generally your name, right? Well, when we begin to understand identity and understanding who God is, let me tell you, you can learn a ton about who God is by studying the names of God. By studying the character of God, the traits of God. I want to give you just a little taste, okay? Just a little taste of who God is through his names, through his character, through what the Bible says about him. First of all, he's called Abba, Father. He is our personal heavenly Father. He's Adonai. He is Lord. He's the Almighty God. He's the, the ruler of the universe. He's the Most High God. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. He's the I Am. He's the everlasting God, the everlasting King, the eternal God. He's the mighty one. He's our rock, our shield, our portion, our refuge. He's the God of all comfort. He's the God of all grace. He's the God of hope. He's the God of peace. He's the God of love. He's the God of mercy. He's the God of salvation. He's the living God. He's the judge of all. He's the Lord Almighty, the great physician. He's the Holy Spirit, our comforter and our helper. When you begin to go through and to study the names of Jesus, he's the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's our Savior. He's our mediator. He's the bread of life, the bright morning star, the light of the world, the living water, the bridegroom, the chief cornerstone. He's wonderful counselor. He's the prince of peace. He's our redeemer. He's the lamb of God. He's the deliverer, the good shepherd. He's the lion of Judah. He's the true vine. He's known in Revelation as faithful and true. He's our high priest who interce intercedes for us. He's the righteous one, the holy one. Last week we talked about how he is our living hope, how Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the resurrection, of the, of, he's the resurrection and the life, and he's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. Listen, our God is amazing. And when you begin to study who he is, you learn a ton about who you are called to be in Christ. Some of you, if you're connected with the names of God, maybe you've studied and you've read through God's word, you understand some of that. You are energized by that. And that grabs a hold of you and you embrace that and you find identity in that because of who God is. Others of you might be here this morning and you're like, I don't know what you just said for the last two, three minutes there. It was kind of confusing. And if, you, and if that's you, listen, you're on the opposite end of the spectrum. You might be confused, but I want you to understand that the true identity begins with knowing God. And the only way to know God begins with knowing Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. See, on your own, you cannot have a personal relationship with God. And so God loved us so much so that he sent his son, Jesus, to pay for our sin at the cross, becoming our mediator, allowing us to have access to God through Christ, through his shed blood. And it's because of the righteousness of Jesus that we can have a relationship with God. This is the gospel message that, as 1 John 4 puts it, that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 
It's, it's the foundation to finding true identity. It begins with accepting Jesus as your personal Savior, allowing Him to be the leader of your life and the forgiver of your sin. And once that takes place, you will find true identity. And once you become a follower of Jesus, He will be your Savior. He will be your God. He will be your comforter. He will be your healer. He will be your sustainer. He will be those characteristics that we looked at in his names personally to you. See, once the foundation is laid, the transformation is incredible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 puts it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, catch that, if you are in Christ, He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. A new creation. All, all throughout the New Testament, we read about being in Christ or about being transformed by Christ. We read about life through Christ. And listen, there's no greater identity than finding identity in Christ. And once you know that and you embrace that and you accept being a follower of Jesus as your own, you grab a hold of that and you read through the New Testament and you see what it means to have life in Christ, the transformation is amazing. You can wish that you were the best, the smartest, the prettiest, the greatest at whatever this life has to offer, but they all pale in comparison to being in Christ. In finding your identity in Christ. We are in Christ, a new creation. God sees us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not through our own. Aren't you thankful for that? He sees you through the perfect, spotless righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he calls us sons and daughters. Children of God, Third John verse or First John three verse one says, "See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called. What a privilege that we should be called children of God, and so we are." I never really recognized the end of this verse, but I want you to grab this. The reason why the world doesn't know us is that it did not know Him. See, the reason why people say, oh, Christians are a bunch of crazy religious people. They, I don't really get them. I don't really understand. You're, they will never understand you. The reason why the world does not know you, doesn't get you, doesn't understand who you are as a follower of Jesus is because they don't know him. And until they know him, they will never understand who we are in Christ. See, once you begin to know who God is, you begin to understand who you are. Once you embrace who God is, and once you have given your life to Christ and you've made that foundation in Him, you're a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. Everything changes. You are then a child of God, a son and daughter of the King. And you are created to worship the one who made you, the one in whose image you were made, and the one who died for you. Let me challenge you, as you go through this week, do what we just sang about. Recognize that you belong to God. That, that, that as Alyssa sang up here, that, that you don't find your worth in wins or in losses and in, in abilities, or in, that you find your worth in Jesus Christ. And that you celebrate your worth in Jesus Christ. That you worship the maker and creator that you behold your God. You know, for me, I, I, I like to worship God through music. My mind just clicks with music. I love music. Maybe you, you like to worship God in another way. Maybe it's through prayer. Maybe you love to take a walk and just enjoy how the creation magnifies the creator. Maybe you love to spend time in prayer and, and diving deep into God's word. Listen, whatever it is, I want to encourage you this week. Spend time worshiping the one who made you in whose image you were made recognize who he is embrace who he is we sang that song earlier behold our god listen to the definition of the word behold 
Behold means to see or observe a thing or a person, especially a remarkable or impressive one. Our God is remarkable. Our God is impressive. Behold our God. Behold your God. Worship him. Listen to the words of Ephesians chapter 3. It says this in verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You can't know who you are unless you know who God is. Maybe you're here and you're trying to find identity in all kinds of things in life. Or maybe you're finding identity through circumstances, through struggles, through trials, through what you've had to go through. Listen, find your identity in Jesus Christ. Behold our God. Recognize him as our maker and creator, the one in whose image we were made, and the one that we were made for. I want to encourage you as we get started in this series, it starts with understanding who God is. Maybe you go throughout this week and you do a little study on some of the names of God, understanding who he is. Maybe you go through this week and you spend some special time in worship. Maybe you, you get your family together and spend some time in worship. I got to tell you, I love when I get together with my family to worship. Yesterday, before I came here to, to study for a while, we got in the middle of our living room and we got together, put our arms around each other, got in a huddle, kind of like a sports team would do, and we spent some time worshiping in prayer together. Spend time with your kids, with your grandkids. Worship together. Get in a small group this week and worship together. And behold our God. Recognize how amazing, how incredible He is. And when you begin to understand who He is, and when you embrace life in Christ, I'm telling you, your identity will be transformed. Because of who He is. And because of what He's done. God, we come before you today overwhelmed at what you've done. We, we come amazed at who you are. We come delighted that you invite us to come before your throne. And God, may we behold you seated on the throne, high and lifted up. May we come humbly before you, but may we come recognizing what we have in Christ. God, we, we can't even begin to comprehend what, what it means that you see us through the righteousness of, our, through your, of your Son. But God, with what we do know and with what we do understand, we're amazed at that. We're so thankful for that. And God, as we start this series, I pray for those that are struggling with identity. I pray for those that are not followers of Jesus Christ, that they would recognize that the reason why they're struggling with identity is because they don't know you. They don't know your son as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray today that they would bow the knee to Jesus Christ and ask him to be the leader of their life and forgiver of sin. For those of us who are followers of Christ, Lord, remind us who you are. Remind us of how great you are. Remind us of, of your names, of your word. And God, when we tend to want to be a Moses and when we tend to want to be a Gideon, remind us of who we are in Jesus Christ. That we are a child of the King. God, do a great work in our hearts. Do a great work through this series. 
God, we commit all of this to you. We entrust it to you in the great name of your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray.